Hey everyone, really excited to have you all here today. Um, it's gonna be an awesome conversation. Uh, just wanna start off with a little bit about Full Table first. Um, Full Table is a project with the intent to create community and conversation with depth by bringing people together around a shared meal, an interest, or a passion. Uh, I started Full Table to address my own desires to meet interesting people and kind of get past that surface level conversation tackle things that I felt really mattered, like know more about those individuals. Uh, I heard a lot of this echoed from friends and family that like, you know, it's great to go to a dinner party, but you just don't learn enough about each person and you meet really interesting people and you want to dive in further. So what I do is I bring together a small group of people and um, around a shared theme in this case, and we dive in and discuss things and your new, or your unique perspectives really kind of come through in an awesome manner and that depth is created and it's a beautiful thing. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, Will Phelan. I'm originally from Rochester, New York. I headed out to west to um, school in Oregon, University of Oregon. And then I ended up in Jackson because um, I worked for a company called Giver and uh, followed an internship with Giver one summer to a job here uh, and to where I work still to this day. Uh, Graham and Allie, unfortunately, were not able to join us today, uh, but they are the full table of creative geniuses behind the food, which is really, really important to the experience is that when you sit down with people, there is a whole nother level of appreciation and connection that can come when you're breaking bread with them and you're sharing food and you're passing wine and all that. And so we're dealing with the coronavirus currently, but uh, that the food component is still a huge part of the full table model. And so um, they're not here, but I'll do a quick reading that uh, Ali has sent my way that, that will properly introduce the theme, which is hunting today, as well as give a little background on why she chose Jägerschnitzel. But some words from Ali are, one must be able to maintain a stealthy existence amid the hunt. A hunter did not have a whole pantry to choose from when out in the wilderness. So one would only have a few staples to get them through their trek, perhaps a potato or two, an onion if they're lucky, and a handful of spices to make their food more flavorful. When I think of hunting, I'm reminding of the romance of it all, the simplicity of life that came from the necessity of foraging and hunting. Before the world of whole foods, factory farms, and commercialism, meat was once considered a delicacy. Most meat was consumed on special occasions, or if you were rich enough, you might have had the ability to have a wild game on your table a few times a week. Hunting has become a, sport, a sort of sport in the modern world, but it does provide us with the ability to step back in time to the days where protein was not a commodity product. This recipe is just that, a step back to simpler times. Let's enter rural Germany a couple hundred years from today, years um, in the past from today, excuse me. It is the spring chanterelle mushrooms are plentiful at the feet of, ven of venerable pine trees. Soft herbs are, emer are emerging from the newly thawed earth fresh water bubbling from a small spring in the distance. Bright green light dances overhead and woodland creatures are, are humming with energy amidst the flora. Wild boar run through the forest, packing the dark earth and creating trails to and from their favorite feasting grounds. The hunter follows these paths and begins the search. So without further ado, you know a little bit about Full Table, a little bit about myself. Um, and now that you have a tasty uh, Jaeger Schnitzel in front of you. I'll pass it off to Jaden to uh, introduce himself. Go ahead, Jaden. College, moved to Wyoming, and then and now working with Wyoming Wildlife Federation, uh, which actually Jesse also works for. Um, so we do kind of on the ground conservation work and do a lot of hunting and angling conservation uh, through our job. And then also, it just so happens both of us are, are passionate hunters and uh, do quite a bit of angling too. Um, my Jaeger schnitzel tonight is actually uh, some elk steak I got last fall. Um, so that seems to fit pretty well. Um, Perfect. Yeah, I'm super stoked to reconnect with all you guys. Uh, we're, like I said, in Lander, so not too far from, from all of you in Jackson. So maybe in less weird times, we'd all get together for this meal. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> How does the elk, elk taste for the eager schnitzel? It works pretty good. It's good. So <laughs> I will, uh, maybe Jess can introduce herself too. She's a, 
what I'd say probably a more proficient hunter even than I am, like, um, and started Artemis, which is a uh, women's hunting organization um, as well. So this is like a perfect theme for her too. I, I was a founder of Artemis, which was to bring women into the hunting space and foster the discussion about why the hunting space has been so male dominated for so long and why it stayed like that and how help, helping shift the dialogue um, to bring more women in, but also for the women that are there to ask them to step into leadership positions and actually have a little louder voices in the conservation arena. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, you guys are a perfect duo for this conversation. I'm stoked. Um, I'll pass it off to Ryan and Emily. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey everybody, um, my name is Ryan Dorgan. Um, met Will through Giver. Glad to be here. Um, I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, which is, um, or I guess a little northeast of South Bend, uh, not far from the Michigan state line. And kind of grew up in, in news. My mom worked in journalism and um, I always wanted to shy away from it for that reason, but kind of ended up in news, uh, working for newspapers in Indiana and Vermont. And then um, moved here to Wyoming in 2013, um, lived in Casper for a couple of years, working for the trip there and uh, just covering the state. And then I moved to Jackson in um, late 2015, early 2016. I've been here ever since. And I'm Emily, Ryan's fiance. Um, I also am a journalist. And I grew up in Southern Illinois, um, a very rural area. It's mostly, it's a farm, a little farm town. And um, from the, for the hunting theme, that's like a big deer hunting area um, and turkey hunting. Um, but as far as like going out and doing it, I'm, I, I don't, I didn't do it growing up, but um, I mainly fished with my dad, um, just spin fishing um, and lots of, lakes in like southern indiana and kentucky um so yeah that's about my knowledge <laughs> of hunting awesome pumped to have you guys and then uh pass it off to charlotte and sam before cam wraps us up are we unmuted you are <laughs> can, can you hear me um yeah so i'm sam <clears throat> Uh, originally from Massachusetts and Charlotte's from Connecticut. Uh, moved out to Jackson about five years ago. I uh, went to school at St. Lawrence University uh, in upstate New York. Um, kind of yearning for the woods. But that's, in regards to hunting, I uh, kind of got into duck hunting a couple years ago out here. And then last year, with the help of Cam, I uh, really got into elk hunting. Unfortunately, I didn't get one, but um, Cam kind of showed me the ropes a lot with, with honey, even though I would say he wasn't a successful hunting guide for me. Um, <laughs> uh, but like, being out here for hunting wise, it's, it's amazing. It just gives me a good excuse just to walk around the woods. And uh, Cam even convinced me to try to get a bear tag this year, too, for the spring. Yeah, I'm just kind of fine-tune my hunting skills but uh even last fall uh charlotte actually came out hunting too for for a couple of days um I can give yeah a that's, that's kind of the extent of my hunting experience but um i grew up in connecticut and went to the university of vermont um and then moved out here just about the same time as sam five years ago um and yeah i i love to fish um, I really enjoyed going elk hunting with Sam this fall. I don't know how it would have gone if we, if he had gotten an elk, but I, <laughs> like he said, really like just being out in the woods and just, I loved like walking off a trail. I'm a big backpacker. Um, so that, you know, and I just love the idea like of someday Sam getting something and us being able to kind of feed ourselves meat wise. That's really important to me. And I do eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian, but you know, I would love to be able to like provide for myself and not have it to get meat from grocery stores. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And then Cam. 
Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're good. Sweet. Yeah, my name's Cam. I'm uh, originally from just outside Lake Tahoe, California. Moved here probably six years ago. Uh, in terms of hunting, uh, I grew up fishing and deer hunting, so probably like 28 years ago was my first deer hunt. Um, and then I guide in the spring and fall in a uh, professional capacity, um, normally specializing in uh, undulids. So, uh, yeah, took Sam out a couple times this fall and, you know, um, wasn't able to punch anything, but, you know, that's how it goes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I I'm a non-hunter. I have never been. N nothing opposed to it by any means. It's fascinating to me. My brother uh, got into it this past uh, I guess a couple of years now. He's got a mule deer, and I believe we might have had an elk last year. I don't remember, but um, I'd love to hear from you guys. Do you all like when you're hunting? Um, or do you have bow hunters in the group? Jaden, are you a bow hunter? One second, Jaden. I uh, got you muted still. I'm just going to unmute everybody. So I, I do bow hunt. Um, I did it kind of out of necessity in Oregon. Like, the tags are easier to come by if you're a bow hunter, but Jess is like almost exclusively a bow hunter. Um, so you've got two of us over here, definitely. Um, I do a lot of rifle hunting, like kind of whenever I can too. So it's, uh, I'm not as much of a specialist as maybe Jess is. So I started hunting. Uh, I'm an adult onset hunter. I started hunting about 10 years ago and I started with a bow and just uh, never changed. And it's something that like I deeply love and uh, have opportunities to hunt with rifles, but um, I think I like the style of bow hunting better and I stick with that pretty often. What does an adult onset hunter mean? <laughs> Somebody that didn't grow up in a hunting family. Um, I, I was a ranch kid and, and had been, a, you know, have a big like, outdoor focused family because of that um but never never hunted growing up and my dad would go and shoot a cow elk and feed the family but never went with him and when i moved back to wyoming from california um i picked up a bow uh and it just never i never it never looked back it's it to the point of where i started hunting and then it informed the career i chose wow that's super cool any other bow hunters in the group? No, I've I've thought about it. Like I've always wanted to, but when my mindset is first, I kind of need to get the more basic skills of hunting down before, I guess, taking the next step to bow hunting. Um, I don't know if that's like a, a naive look at it, but that's kind of my. Um, my thought process of it. I would eventually love to. It, it seems amazing, like a great experience being able to get that close to an animal. But I don't know, I feel like I first need to get an elk first rather than trying to dive headfirst into actual bow hunting. But I don't know if you guys are more experienced, what your guys' thoughts on that are. I think whatever you feel comfortable with is the right first step. So like if rifle is what feels good and like exactly how you're describing, if that's like what you want to do, I think that's the perfect first step to take. And like, I certainly know that um, I'm not, a lot of the people that are getting into hunting or have gotten into hunting um, do, do the rifle game first. And I happened to be dating a man who was an avid bow hunter at the time, which is why I ended up with a bow first. And I'm so glad I did, but um, also like wh the, the direction you're going, is absolutely what a lot of people do very successfully. I totally think like it depends so much on who your mentor is. Cause like someone who can teach you a certain style or, or teach you woodsmanship in relation to hunting is going to help impact like, how you learn and what you learn too. So like, I wouldn't take that for granted at all. Just, just be like almighty mentor, like teach me the way. <laughs> but also challenge them if they do something that you don't feel comfortable with. It's good to say that because I think a lot of mentors are poorly trained mentors and ruin an outdoors experience for people because of it. Hmm. 
Cam, who is uh, your mentor? I know you've been working with Sam um, the past year, he said, but like, who'd you grow up um, hunting with? You say your dad, is that right? Uh, no, my dad's a non-hunter. Um, he fishes, but I have, um, it was basically my best friend from like third grade. Uh, his dad is a big hunter and anymore moving into like the professional side of things. I have a buddy who guides up in Montana. Uh, he's one of the best cat guides in the U S. So, you know, in terms of running guided hunts, I kind of look to him, but in terms of woodmanship, I have a, a good buddy out here who's 64 and has pretty much been hunted since he was born. Um, and oh. you know, they do the older generation, they do shit a little differently, but you know, those things have worked for generations, you know, like people kind of nerd out on patterns and camo and, my grandfather was hunting in red and black flannel, you know, so it's kind of like, you know, once you learn how to be where you need to be and move when you don't need to move, you know, the rest of it kind of comes fairly easily. Hmm. What, um, you, you said that, like, like the kind of like older techniques, like what's background on that for someone like myself? Um, well, like in terms of just bear, bears, what's hunting right now. So the old guys, they used to take bear scat and if they, where they found the scat wasn't in uh, a good shooting lane, it wasn't the shot they wanted to take. They would just pick it up and move it into their shot. Um, and it works because bears leave scat. Um, it's not like, oh, I have to poop. They poop is like a gingerbread trail. So they're leaving themselves a trail to get back onto the food. And depending on what they're eating, it obviously, you know, it'll show in the scat. But if you just pick it up and move it into your, your shot window, they're going to come right back onto it because they think that that's how they're getting to their food. That's really cool. Wow. Is that common knowledge? I mean, do you guys all, are you all like, yeah, yeah, of course. I have no idea. That's I didn't wild. know that. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely, like, heard things like that. And it's one of those, like, old-timey tradition thing that I go, like, no way and i don't try it myself but like it's like that's part of part of the storytelling and and part of the traditions that like my grandpa or like cam's 64 year old like friend who's a mentor like their traditions and their knowledge that are passed down almost mean more than like the successfulness of of what it takes to hunt um we used to do deer drives back home and if you do like mule deer deer drives you get like a group of people together and everyone walks through like a thicket and like you know if you're walking through the thicket you might get a shot if you're sitting at the other side of the thicket you might get a shot but like it is not effective if you just like want to be a one person like successful guy <laughs> or gal but uh it is effective if you want to get one for the group and it's like a really cool like tradition that i grew up doing that was more about being with people that you really enjoy and like having this like old old school like camaraderie like with the hunt process than it is about just one person shooting something and, and it being all about that one person. So yeah, those old timey traditions are super like Im important and maybe different than um, if you grow up um, with some newer, newer style tactics. It's pretty fascinating, I mean, Whenever I hear people going out for a hunt, it's usually like, oh, I've got my buddy coming with me just in case I get something. Is that community component uh, still like a present component? I mean, like for, I see you, Ryan, do you hunt yourself? I know you take shots of hunters. I see those pretty often in the fall kind of thing. But do you, do you feel like there's a camaraderie out there or? Um, I am, I'm a lousy hunter. I'm an enthusiastic <laughs> outdoorsman, but, um, my motivation for hunting and fishing is, you know, like you guys have said, just kind of being outside and taking pictures in beautiful places and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think anytime you're outside, it, it pays for one reason or another to have people with you. You know, sometimes it's nice to just kind of go off on your own, but whether for just camaraderie or safety or whatever, you know, I think it's always nice to have some partners out there. I think there's camaraderie in a big way still among like hunters in the sense of I had a 
shot on a bull a couple of years ago with a bow that felt like a really good shot and I ended up losing the bull and in looking for this animal for five days um, there was just elk bugling everywhere it was in the middle of archery season it was like prime hunting and I ran into somebody uh, as I was looking for my bull who was also hunting elk in that area never met him before older guy like in his 60s and he was just out alone with his bow and hunting and um i told him what had happened and i was like if you find a bull down like i know it was a fatal shot like this bull's not alive i'm just looking for like him um but if you find him like can you leave a note on my truck that's at the trailhead or something he's like every one of us has lost an animal at this point and he actually stopped hunting for two and a half days and helped me find he ended up being the one that found it stopped hunting and like for someone that like is an archer in the middle of like i'm not kidding like nine different elk were bugling in this basin and coming in and like, it was just like you don't get days like that hunting very often and for this guy to sympathize having experienced something like that before having never met me before to put down his bow and spend the next like 48 hours basically uh, looking for this elk and being the one that actually found it. Like um, that, that was such a demonstration of the fact of like, there is a vein of like camaraderie in the sense of like, we know what it's like to be out there. We've been there. Like it's a gut wrenching, horrible feeling to lose an animal. Um, and that I thought that similarity was like really indicative of the fact that there are some really beautiful parts of this community that's still very much alive. Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> again, as a, like a non-hunter, it, there's definitely like an alpha kind of like energy to it, it seems that like, oh, well, you're not uh, rolling up at 2 a.m. Well, you're late, like we're out, like, out, out there without you and like, so it's, it's fascinating to hear, I mean, that story as well as just, like, your works just within, um, with, um, not asterisk, what, what's the name again? Uh, uh, Artemis. Artemis. Um, that, like, to be getting more women out there, I mean, can you speak to that more? I'm curious, I mean, and then Emily and Charlotte, like, I would love to hear more from the two of you that I, um, I don't really know, I don't think any females that hunt myself. I, it was really, um, it took me a little bit, I think, to even realize, like, how gender biased the hunting community is, <laughs> but it's not, in a, it's not malicious, like, I don't ever think it's done, like, purposefully, it's just, like, this is the way it's always been, and we're just used to it that way, but, like, it's everything from our language, I mean, we call it sportsmen, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, it's everything to the language we use, all the way into just, like, uh, there's not gear out there or there hasn't been there is beginning to be now but getting into it even 10 years ago there wasn't gear out there that was comparable to men's gear so like we were trying to get out and go hunting but we were colder wetter with ill-fitting gear which is not a recipe to keep a new hunter or a new outdoorsman regardless outside um but it was never in a way that I thought was like malicious or like, you know, the patriarchy stuffing things down my throat. It was just like this kind of felt unfriendly um, and, and in a uh, accidental way. And I think uh, it took me a while to realize that like all my friends, everybody that I talked to, the people that were around my campfire when I was telling stories were all men. And I told stories a little differently than they did. And I started realizing that like, there's a language, there's a way that we talk about it. There's a way that we portray hunting that is not necessarily uh, interesting or alluring to women. <laughs> it's very like, exactly like you said, it's macho, it's ego. It's that's what leads with it, which is what sells because right now the industry is driving a lot of the image of hunting. Um, and so what sells is what drives the image and the image is what drives people who think they can get into it or relate to it or be part of it. And so a lot of the work that I do is to be a voice that's like grateful for those who have been in the industry, grateful for the traditions that have brought it as far as it is and a gentle criticism of like, we will have to change if we want others to get into hunting. Um, and from the conservation perspective, the more people that are hunting, the more funding is brought into the conservation world. So it's kind of that symbiotic, like 
wanting to expand this industry in a place that's friendly for a lot more people than just the classic traditional um, hunter. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think what you're doing is badass. That's so cool. And I, uh, I myself was, am, was very naive to hunting and it honestly, sorry, my dog, uh, it surprised me like when I went with Sam, I'm like, wait, this rocks. Like, this is such a wonderful way to spend the day. I, I don't know if I was ready to pick up a gun yet, but it was really just cool to be a part of that. And I don't think that I, or it's not even really out there, like what somebody does when they go elk hunting for a day. So it's just cool to get out there. And I definitely told my girlfriends about it. And um, yeah, I, I think it's really cool what you're doing. And hopefully I'll get a little more into it here as we go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys are only in Jackson. Maybe we'll come up and elk hunt in your neck of the woods. I would love that. That'd be so fun. Yeah, absolutely. As far as the female stuff goes, the only thing like, I, I joke with Ryan about um, hating how like massive commercial retail is always like pushing like hot pink camouflage. <laughs> and, like, how like if I want to go out hunting, which I always feel really like honored when Ryan, when Ryan always invites me when he goes bird hunting, because um, you know, it's, it's just a great hike. Um, you know, it's like, I don't want to have to wear a hot pink camo like I want to blend in with the guys <laughs> there's so many brands that in the last five years have woken up to the fact that women aren't like just like right out of the gate pink or turquoise <laughs> good I'm glad that they're progressing because it's it's one of my pet peeves <laughs> yeah check out there's Sitka um Proist and First Light are sort of the three leading ones that have amazing women's lines that are comparable to the men's, if not like sometimes better fitting than other outdoor gear lines, women's wise. And on top of that, they don't have a stitch of pink on them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, thank you. <laughs> I mean, so like, like Cam was saying, is, is the camo that essential? Or are you guys like, oh yeah, you have to wear it or you're, just scaring away all the animals or is it like, like has that become part of that commercialization and they're working towards like hey if you're a hunter you wear a camo or or is it really that important to the experience i think it gives you an edge but it's not in critical i think all it does is it gives you like three or four more feet closer to the animal i honestly like fred bear who's like one of the greater archers in history was exactly like cam said like black and red flannel and jeans and you know it's, it's more about reading the landscape knowing your wildlife and like being a skilled outdoorsman I have think than the gear that you have as long as you're like warm and you know can stay out there like good gear that keeps you outside is gear that's going to make you a successful hunter whether it's camel or not the, the uh the guy who the guy who taught my hunter safety course uh, in college, he's probably like 65 years old, uh, grew up in upstate New York hunting his whole life, and his family got him a blaze orange uh, onesie jumpsuit. And he's got a story about how he, I think he fell asleep just at the base of a tree and woke up to like a deer like sniffing him. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, it doesn't, awesome. doesn't fucking matter what you wear, really. <laughs> But it's just like an old timey story of just like doesn't really matter the modern gear like what you wear kind of like what cam was saying it's just like where you are so then yeah, I don't know, like, that spectrum are there like um when it comes to the gear if the um kind of apparel component isn't as essential have the guns and like the the um I mean, I guess whatever gear you use to clean and harvest an animal, has that come leaps and bounds, you feel, in the past few years? Yeah, I'd say probably the thing that's changed the most has been optics. You know, most of the calibers that we're taking any sort of big game with, it's the same shit we've been shooting 80, 100 years. You know, the 45, 70 is still anything that, you know, has paws or claws. That's what I want to use. And then the Ot 6 3030 has probably harvested more animals worldwide than any other two calibers. You know, there's a lot of new great rounds, but you know, if you can't shoot it, it really doesn't matter. So, you know, plenty of animals are harvested with 22s. You know, if you're 
comfortable enough and good enough to stock an animal down to 22 range. Nothing gear wise is going to outshoot or outview shot placement. You know, um, it's really about getting in a comfortable spot and being able to place your round or, you know, get in where you can put an arrow through something, you know, and, and feel confident about it, um, you know, and not have to take that hesitation like shit am I in a good spot for myself not necessarily just the animal you know uh, how does that translate to your guiding gam do you do you feel like you have people um on like a regular basis who are as completely underprepared or is it like you only go out with people that already feel comfortable and are already at like a certain like caliber or skill level uh, my first couple years it was just whatever hunters were assigned to me I really didn't have the privilege of being able to choose my clients. And uh, we got down in a little grays and from camp to where we hunt, you know, you're doing 18 to 20 miles on horseback at a minimum. That's without, you know, harvesting an animal or really kind of putting in any extra work. So um, people blow up. We recommend them taking like a horsemanship class before they get here because, you know, it's really not a walkable kind of hunt. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like trying to, teach a three-year-old who's banging a trash can how to be quiet you know they're just so underprepared and they may have hunted like in you know Tennessee or Texas you know doing a pig hunt where they're just driving around in razors hammered shooting or whatever and <laughs> out here you know it's, it's a much different kind of thing and sometimes you luck out and you get people who are you know they may be skilled shots but not skilled hunters um, and that's kind of like the breakdown for me hunting is not harvesting there's a big difference there you know hunting to me is the stock and putting in the work trying to figure out where the animals are how do i get closer to them you know and then once you pull the trigger that's that's when it's work and it's not you know to me that's the least enjoyable part not because i care about killing animals you know that's part of what i do but you know that's just the the non-fun part for me i think that you know uh, people that need to shoot you know get further and further away from their target they're just poor hunters you know they don't really hunt they're just hired guns at that point it's i think it's that's part of the uh, thought process that keeps me stuck in the bow hunting like I, I i have no issue with rifles and rifle hunts have been just as hard as bow hunts in my book but the it's the proximity to the wildlife that a bow affords you especially during the season that um that's that's what has made such a fanatical hunter out of me wow um, uh, Sam, you mentioned that you took like, like a course. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like it took you from like not knowing anything to mildly prepared? Like, like how essential was that? Is, it, is everybody here taking a course like that? Uh, well, so I believe it's, it's not required. Uh, it's a hunter safety course. Um, so, um, oh, is it pretty sure it is for, Required, yes. Um, so yeah, it is required, but it teaches you kind of basic uh, safety, um, uh, I guess, safety precautions while hunting, um, what to do, what not to do. Uh, but in terms of teaching you like how to hunt, it's not really too in depth, uh, or at least my course wasn't. Um, it was more of just like how to carry a rifle, like where to obviously point your rifle, where to not point it. Um, but an avalanche safety course kind of vibe? Mm, no. Well, like a know before you go or like a what's in your pack class. They're pretty uninformative. It's just like shotguns are measured in gauge. Rifles are yeah. measured in caliber. Like Yeah, it's 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 more of like just basics of like like I was saying, like how to carry your rifle, like don't point it at someone, point it at the ground or point it straight in the air. Um, but like in terms of like actually hunting, it really wasn't too in depth of like how to stalk an animal or what to like look for. Um, but I, I think the best way or like in my experience is just getting out there. Like this past fall, I think I went probably close to like 20 days hunting. Um, I calculated I walked over like 115 miles. Um, nice. 
a lot of days like with Cam, a lot of days with some other buddies. And then towards the end, I was just going out like every day by myself just to like get experience. Um, and that was like one of the good advice my buddy told me like during the summer. It's like, you just kind of have to go and just like learn and figure it out yourself too, to a certain extent. Um, I guess to answer your question, the hunter safety course, no, it's not really like a crash course on hunting. It's more or less like a, a government required class of like how to not like shoot your hunting partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's like, so they do offer classes though that are more, I say they, I'm just like somebody out there is doing classes that are more hands-on, like helpful, right? My, my brother did like a harvesting like the actual like taking apart the animal and cleaning them, all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure where the harvesting phrase gets used by hunters, but um, they have courses like that that are more helpful, right? There's like a bunch of different uh, NGOs that are doing things like that. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers does an introduction to hunting course. I think it's called Hunting for Sustainability. Um, and it's like they bring maybe 10 or 12 parts and they take them out on like a white tailed doe hunt, which is a pretty easy like over the counter tag to get. And they'll teach them the basics of that kind of thing. And when someone gets a deer down, everybody uh, gets to be there and watch it be harvested, like broken down and butchered. Um, most of the game agencies in each state run something called Bow, which is a becoming an outdoors woman. And that is like a sort of intro to hunting course, a little bit like what you're talking about, Will. And then they've started these things called Beyond Bow, which is uh, taking and it's matching uh, the, the people that took bow with a mentor to actually go out in the field for that fall. Um, and then there's a bunch of different organizations that are like First Hunt and Youth Hunt and a bunch of things that are taking kids out um, and teaching that. And then there's the other side of that where like Artemis does a series we called Go Confident. Um, and it's a, it's essentially like, uh, uh, how to go confident in the woods, how to go confident on the water. We have two of those. One's like an intro to hunting and the other one is an intro to angling. Um, and then we also have a go, go confident into the legislature and that's the policy side of it. But, uh, they, so there's a bunch, almost every hunting organization in one way or the other, they call it R3, which is that like recruitment, retention and reactivation. And that's like talking about recruiting new hunters, retaining the hunters that are like in, within your um, midst. And then the retention is like those hunters that are, uh, or reactivation is the ones that are like people that started hunting maybe a while ago and whether they were unsuccessful or for whatever reason like stopped, um, they, it's trying to get them back into it. And almost every fish and game agency, whether it's Wyoming Game and Fish Department, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, they all have initiatives underneath their uh, like policies and programs is to support the R, like R3. One of my background is really with podcasts too. Um, and from that, like I've, I've met a bunch of folks who run like courses and stuff. Uh, it's really actually centered around Bozeman has a ton of like really good uh, courses and both online and in person. Uh, my friend Ryan runs this Western hunting summit that's coming up this, this spring. And that's like, if you've been hunting and want to go like maybe become more successful or like take a bigger animal or like challenge you to push yourself in different ways. Like those kinds of courses are also available, but oftentimes those are like more that you pay for them. And like these non-government or, or these NGOs and, and, and fish and game agencies provide more like free resources. So there's like a lot of ways you can take it. Yeah, yeah that, that was one of my questions was like the, the bow and beyond bow, it, how approachable is that cost? You're, is, you're saying it's free? It's, I think uh, it's, it's maybe 150 bucks for like five days for the bow. And, and that's more like covering like food sort of things. So the state agency at least breaks even on that. The idea behind all of this is because hunting and angling, when you purchase a license, the dollars go directly back into the management of wildlife. So like, especially in Wyoming, our Wyoming Game and Fish Department is 100% funded by the hunting license dollars. And so the more people that are hunting, the more people that are buying hunting licenses, fishing licenses, conservation stamps, 
the more funding that they have to do research and management on the wildlife, not just ungulates and huntable wildlife, but the non-game as well. And then the other, so like their thought process is in supporting the like R3 initiatives, you're essentially like ensuring future funding, which sounds like super, it, it you know, they mean it in a much bigger way of like connecting people to the outdoors and all of that kind of stuff, but it's the nitty gritty dollars of it it makes sense for them to make this a free resource because it is potentially funding them in like the past times other, other than the dollars coming from firearm sales. Ryan and Emily, do you feel that you have a decent amount of that or, or, or is that something that you think like, Oh, it's fall. We have to do our, our uh, seasonal hunting uh, article. But, like, because it, I've heard that from hunters, hey, like it's way more of the conservation component and the importance of it, it really stretches beyond just harvesting an animal and having the food available. Do you, if you feel like that on the uh, news and guide side that is covered well enough or? Mm, um. and that could be a loaded question. I, I, don't, I don't intend it to be, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's fine. Um. I don't know, you know, I don't, I, we do have, we're lucky here to have like a dedicated outdoors and environmental reporter, which a lot of newspapers don't have anymore these days. Um, Mike Cosmal is his name and he's, you know, he's a, he grew up in Minnesota and loves the outdoors and, you know, is always hunting. So I think he has a really good, you know, he's always kind of on the pulse of what's happening um, with state game agencies and you know, land management agencies and what the new regulations are or kind of what, what's going on year by year in, in the world of hunters. Um, but as far as like consistency, I don't know. I think like, you know, if he gets a good news hook, like if there's a big change. Um, Regulation. Know, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll devote, you know, resources to covering that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we can't have like, a section or anything dedicated to outdoors and hunting like I'm sure newspapers used to in the past. <laughs> I feel like the Jackson Hole News and Guide has done a great job of keeping up with like the major regulation changes. I know like you guys are often the first ones out with a lot of the information. It's either between you or the Casper Star. <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear. Yeah, like, like I said, Mike, <laughs> he is, uh, Mike just like lives and breathes the outdoors and especially the Mountain West. So he's, he's usually on top of stuff. It's good to hear that thing. A lot of it too is like like some of the stuff that drives our like outdoors or um, environmental coverage is like um, like what's going on. So like I mean I don't know if there's like a hunting accident or if there's like a poaching or something like that. Like we're we're usually um, all over that, which is kind of like under that same umbrella. Yeah, yeah. The the, uh, the ability to take that information and make it like approachable to somebody who's not in that world is definitely like a fascinating concept and i uh anybody here read modern huntsman yeah <laughs> so yeah. jess was like a guest editor for the women's issue <laughs> <laughs> it's i mean it, it, it's incredibly produced and like honestly ryan your photography is like something i would see in that magazine right it's, it's, it really is it's, it's wonderfully done um but that, like, it takes it and it makes it super approachable for someone like myself. I'm like, oh, now I understand why it's important. And now I want to go be part of this. Um, but, but I just feel like that's not quite conveyed enough. Um, just like maybe even within our, like, normal community conversations, right? That, like, it's something that keeps me up at night, Well, Like, it is <laughs> it's so infuriating because, like, you know, and you meet all these amazing hunters and, and Jaden and I talk about this a lot because Jaden comes from like the traditional background and I come from the background that had to wrestle with getting into hunting and like uh, the voice that I heard and feeling really ostracized and not relatable. And then there, there's a balance that has to be struck there. And I think the tide's changing and it's changing really slowly, but things like Modern Huntsman, um, that voice is reaching outside of the choir and you know like the numbers less less than five percent of the population of the u.s is hunters less than five 
a solid like 11% are vehemently against hunting and everybody else on that are sort of like in your in your shoes where they're not hunters they don't necessarily have any augurden opinions um but that scale can tip really fast by having incidents like i'm sure you guys remember cecil the lion or things like that where it can take a non-hunter and turn them into an anti-hunter real fast because there's not a story that's told it's a poorly done photo it gets into the wrong hands and the respect and the effort and the ethic is not talked about and so when you have uh whether it's modern huntsmen or even you know whether i agree with their voice all the time or not meat eater um which is another like media company that's doing a lot of work in the hunting world um they're, they're going and they're taking steps to say tell more of the story than just the harvest or just the kill which I think is really easy if you've grown up in the world of hunting to understand what a grip and grin, which is when somebody's holding up the dead head or standing over an elk they just shot and they're smiling and it's triumphant because it's exactly what it feels like. It's amazing to be in that moment. But a photo doesn't convey the story or any kind of the nuance or any kind of the emotion that goes into that kind of moment there. And someone that hasn't been in the field doesn't understand where their food comes from or just like doesn't have any familiarity with hunting can look at that and just only see ego and machismo and that's all that's portrayed right out of the gate and so we're not talking about it or expanding it out and it was something I was really I felt very blessed to work on the women's issue with modern huntsmen because I believe so strongly in that but it's nice to hear um from a non-hunter perspective that that I mean it's nice to reaffirm that that is a problem and we are working to change that but it's going to be way slow to change because the hunting community is an augured in group of opinions <laughs> well it's nice to have things like you know like modern huntsmen and like the meat eater because they're just it seems like <clears throat> especially in places of the country like parts of the country like this everyone knows someone yeah who hunts um you know with varying degrees of regularity but there's for whatever reason it's just kind of a tough subject to approach for some people you know you can be best friends with somebody and if you grew up not hunting um it, it's not really the easiest thing to kind of ask about i mean that's that's how it was for me i i never touched a gun until i moved to wyoming and um i had plenty of friends who who grew up hunting and until i got the invitation you know, it was just something that was really tough to do. And it's, you know, things that are going mainstream, like modern huntsmen and mediator are just making it so much more accessible for people to kind of like say, hey, I'm curious about this. You know about this, right? Can you help me out? I mean, it's, it's you know, what's interesting. And I don't know if Will remembers this from college or not, but like, I never had hunting conversations in, in college. I mean, we went to school at University of Oregon, right? It was very much so like, like, not only was I felt like in the minority as like a hunter but like at the same time I felt like there are a lot of folks who probably were very anti who were in my friend group and like who I really appreciated as folks and like I just ne it never became a conversation that we had and I think like you're nailing it like it's difficult especially for someone who ha like doesn't have any beginning baseline to start a conversation about like what hunting actually is um so I think that's a really good point and something that we need to keep in mind yeah, I mean, it's almost like a, a double-edged sword of, uh, as somebody who's not in that space, it's, I hear Ryan, it's intimidating to go up to someone like, I mean, Cam's like, hey, I'm going to go walk through the woods for 50 miles tomorrow and <laughs> be able to keep up because I want to get an elk. Like, I get it, right? But it's like, I don't want to be that guy that's dragging him down. And so there, there's a lot of reasons why it's intimidating to uh, be that and kind of bridge that gap. But on the other side of things, like you're saying, Jaden, um, that like, how can we change the, the like, the paradigm, or like, how can we make it more accessible for hunters to voice those things with excitement and be like, be proud of what they're doing? Because that's equally important, right? Like, if you in college had come up to me and said, "Hey, man, I'm going on this deer hunt or whatever. I'm super fired up," um, then like, yeah, I would have loved to go with you, but I never knew it, right? And then if yeah. I, you were a hunter, I probably wouldn't have approached you because I just like 
just didn't feel comfortable doing that. Oh, well, Jaden's guys hunting buddies, right? Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. They were shot a gun, you know? Um, did, did you know Gunnar Hansen, like, you grew up hunting too? Yeah, yeah. Dude, I didn't know that until after college, and I spent a ton of time with him. <laughs> like, um, I'm actually, I need to call him after this because he's got to apply for orgs and tags. But, like, it, it was something that I realized, like, Dude, two hunters, like, in a place where we were a minority, we still never brought it up in conversation, which just kind of blows my mind. It's a, I, it does feel, like, a little bit like walking the plank. I feel like um, a lot of the work with Artemis put me in an arena that was a non-hunting conservation arena, but talking about women and bringing more women into the conservation world, so it was, like, um, I attended a Women in Conservation Leadership Summit where I was 350 women, and I was one of three hunters in the entire, like, conference. Wow. And they asked me to get on stage and talk about hunting, and, like, it, it is, like, the first question right out of the gate was, like, how do you consider yourself a conservationist when you murder deer? <laughs> um, so <Gosh>. it's, like, <laughs> like, on stage, you know, and, and so it, it is a little bit like walking the plank, but I think because hunters are a minority, because we've done so poorly at, 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 communicating what it is and it's our fault we don't police within our own ranks and we don't call out the bad actors and we don't educate each other and we don't encourage each other to talk about it in uncomfortable positions like um so it's our own fault we're in this position but like we also have to like kind of it's on the onerous is on the hunter um in my opinion to sort of reach out and communicate and be that person that goes like, Hey, I'm going to go deer hunting. Do you want to come with me? Um, and if somebody says, I just dis- disagree vehemently with what you say, you just have to have the ability to be like, that's fine. And I'm glad that you care enough to disagree. I think that's cool. Um, and just move on. But it's, it's scary as hell to do that. <laughs> it, it, it seems to take a lot of time and energy on the hunter's part to like, um, kind of, educate somebody right They're like hey cam i would love to go hunting with you but then he needs to show me how to do these like a hundred things right that is so skill oriented that that for me like i'm like oh i'll bring my hiking shoes in a backpack and like hopefully i can throw some meat in there for you buddy like it's i, I bring it down to like, this really simple concept which of course it's not and so like, the education component and the ability to like be patient is tough in any regard especially when like you have a very specific season and you're going to go out and walk for a hundred miles and might even see a single elk that like, all those unknowns, it takes a whole nother kind of patience, which I can imagine being difficult. Like Cam, you're, you're guiding. Do people just like assume you're going to get an animal every time? Were they, were they just like, Oh yeah. Like, here we go. I can't wait for my elk. Um, with my outfitter, we don't run a guarantee. So if you've never been on a guided hunt, what a guarantee is, is we guarantee you either get a shot or an animal or both, right? Uh, my outfitter just guarantees that you have food to eat at camp, right? Um, we guarantee everything else around it. But yeah, I mean, like I had a hunter two falls ago who came out um, and this is, he was doing a, a combo hunt. So elk and um, muley. And he was saying that he wasn't going to shoot anything under a certain value mark um, for antlers. Um, and Mealy and Wyoming are not known for like being Booney Crockett, you know? So like you get people who think that, they, I guess they don't really understand what hunting is, you know? Um, like that, that breakdown has happened, you know, because of the photos where people think, oh, he's a hunter, so all he does is kill. Like I've never had a give me hunt where you just get out the car, out the trailhead and boom, you're done like five yards from it, you know? It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I think, yeah, it's definitely getting a little better about telling the story of that the hunt is the work that you're putting in and people that I've taken out that are not hunters, you know, I think they're kind of blown away at how much just sitting and looking through binos there is, you know, (laughs) that's pretty much 90% of what, you know, at least as a guy, that's all I do. I don't, I don't pull the trigger. I do a lot of knife work, you know, cleaning the animal, but you know, 90-95% 90-95% of what I'm doing is literally just looking at the ground, kind of reading the temps, 
figuring out where water is at, and then just looking through binos and picking trees apart. Like that to me is what hunting is. It's not anything else. Mm -hmm. it, it, you said mentioned that there's like some outfitters um, have a guarantee. Yeah, um, my How buddy down in Mexico. Because uh, it's it's an actual ranch, so it's a fenced ranch that they have like a, a privatized herd that you know the average just to get in on there is like sixty seventy thousand dollars to go down there um, at Bermejo in New Mexico and hunt these elk. Um, some oh of the largest gosh. bulls in the country, um, and they they guarantee that you'll have a shot on an animal. But it's because they can just drive the roads to the different herds. It's really like the hunt is gone, and it's just for people who want to put something on the wall. You know, they're just they're hunting for for antlers they're not in a story they're not hunting for meat you know like and i think you know most people that are you know paying that high of a dollar mark they've kind of forgotten that just hunting alone gives you a story you know some dumb shit inadvertently always happens on every hunt where you're like i wasn't intending on sitting in the rain for seven hours or like you know sam and i went out and it's like snow rain sleep wind sun you know like you you have some <laughs> dumb story that comes out of every hunt other than you know, I always tell my guys that come out on my hunts, you can't eat an antler, you know, like if you have an either tag, it looks cool hanging on the wall. But when you open up the deep freeze, a bull looks exactly the same as a cow. <laughs> yeah, the, the best line you said, Cam, was you can't eat a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but our, uh, within the hunter realm, Let's see, we're at an hour right now, so I'll, I'll wrap it up here soon for you guys. But um, I, mean, I am curious about, as a giver, we had, I posted an image in the past year of um, this big, like, not huge shark, but a shark on the beach with this guy holding it and whole family there smiling, right? And it was like, the guy, the guy was wearing a, wearing a giver tank, so it wasn't just like a, a random post. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got like, torn apart on um, the post like oh my gosh unfollow i can't believe you would post this kind of thing like people were fired up um and like i was like before i posted it i made sure because i knew like it was kind of a uh, to that kind of feedback um that like what's this guy's deal and he, he apparently is like one of the best uh catch and release shark fishermen down in southern california or carolina or wherever it was right and even explaining that in like the caption didn't get um, like so prompted those feedback within the tr and that was like a, a shark. What are the hunters' views on like trophy hunting? I mean, I know that's like a that one's a loaded question for you, but is it something that that like oh yeah, there's it's okay up to this point, or is it like unacceptable? Is it completely fine? What are, you, what are your guys' thoughts on that, kind of that space? My first question is, what do you mean by trophy hunting? Because everybody has a different definition. You know, some people think trophy hunting is going to Africa and hunting in Africa, which yeah. that's an entirely different argument because you're talking about conservation dollars that wouldn't come in any other way. And it's unfortunate and it doesn't stomach well, but it's also the reality of where it's at. Or are you talking about trophy hunting where you go in and you pass up the spike elk because you're looking for a larger elk. And in that case, I definitely fall into that. But my reasoning has less to do with antlers and more to do with how smart the animal is and how long he's been on the earth and the hunting that's going in there. Um, and so there's like my, it's such a rabbit hole. Like you could have a whole thing just around tr trophy hunting, but like it's my, my, every time I say that, it's like, what is your definition of a trophy hunter? And not just like, oh, the guy that killed Cecil the lion. Like, I want to know, like, what's your nuance of a trophy hunter? And, and what's the thought process that you think trophy hunters go through that makes them a trophy hunter? Well, I mean, that's like the perfect response is that I, I don't think the average Joe, again, like a, a non-hunter average Joe, even like makes that differentiation that it's like, oh, it's the killing of animals like this would be my definition top of my head would be like the killing of animals to not eat them and that there's an exotic component like you're saying like the africa part or um yeah that's where i would go with it but it's super interesting to hear that like it's not that clear cut and um 
that, did anybody else like back that up? Is that how you guys all view that as well? I don't know about what Cam thinks, but so like, I like to set goals like in ways to help myself like become a better hunter and like it pushes me to be a better hunter. So like in 2020, I have this goal to shoot two bucks like that have a certain antler size that, you know, is like kind of more difficult to achieve, right? In order to like achieve those goals, I would imagine that either A, I'm going to fail and spend the entire season in the woods or B, I'll like, like succeed, but it will be very difficult. And like those kinds of things are like really interesting to me, not from like the perspective of I'm going to go out there and, you know, use my, my pocketbook to pay for this certain antler size, but like I'm going to push myself and, and match my wits against an older critter to like um, hopefully come out what you would like, what I would term successful. But everyone's definition of success is also different too. It also depends on like where you're at, like in your outdoor experiences too. So it's not like one way is the right way or like one definition of trophy hunting is like the right versus wrong. Though a lot of folks will like communicate that. Um, there's just a lot of nuance to it. And it's, it's really difficult to communicate, especially like in a, in a simple way. I always recommend if they go towards the exotic side, Tyler Sharp in the first Modern Huntsman wrote an incredible essay on hunting in Africa that is like very nuanced and it understands how uncomfortable it is to see something like that. But it also talks about the reality and it acknowledges the dark parts. It also talks about how not everything is like that. And I think that goes for the whole of the hunting world where most, un unfortunately, it's the bad actors that get press. You know, it's the people that are doing it wrong that usually make headlines and because that's what sells. And um, so, so folks' vision of what trophy hunting is has been shaped by all the bad actors of trophy hunting um, as opposed to the like 98% of the rest of the hunters that are like do that, that do it right and do it ethically and have a very different motivation they don't talk about it and they don't talk about it on the big stage. So it gets, you know, my pushback has always just been like, I, I want you to describe to me what like the quintessential trophy hunter is, because if you want me to talk about how I feel about it, oftentimes in some definitions, I fall into the category of a trophy hunter because I don't take the first animal that steps in my range. Mm. Um, and it's for very specific reasons. But on the other side of that, I've been bear hunting now for two years with my bow and this is my third year, and I've been full draw on a bear with a perfectly good shot. It was a nice bear. It, there was no reason not to shoot it, and I just could not lose the arrow, and I can't tell you why. I don't have, like, any good reason for it um, other than, like, I, sometimes the shot's not right for no particular reason. Um, so there's, like, those, that's that double-edged sword of, like, I want to hunt a bear. <laughs> But also yeah. sometimes I don't want to shoot a bear. And I, I don't know. I think it's it's a lot more nuanced. And anytime people ask about trophy hunting, my like question is like, do you have like seven hours? Like let's go hunting and sit on the hill and talk about it. <laughs> I don't know about like the new hunters. I'd love to hear some like some of the newer or like non-hunter perspective on this situation though. Yeah. I just think like personally, it uh, like in a kind of harsh way, I, I get kind of pissed off when people get really angry about these things. And in my head, it's like the Sicily lion or whatever. But I just think that person probably went home and ate like a breast of chicken from the grocery store from an animal that's been sitting in a one foot by one foot cage their whole life. Like, in my opinion, I just, why put your anger towards like someone who's going into the woods and, or wherever they're going and, you know, having to work in some aspect, whether it's they paid $50,000 to drive in a car and shoot an animal, that's pretty messed up. But also they're giving $50,000 to something rather than, you know, spending $3 to support like pigs going through shoots. And like, that's what really upsets me personally, even though I do eat meat from the grocery store, I'm no angel here, but I, I just like, I don't know why people choose to put their anger there. And I'm not a hunter. I don't, but I just, it, really irritates me personally. And I'm from Fairfield County, Connecticut. So many of my friends would see like, if Sam did get an elk, they'd be like, what? Or even I've told people from home, like, 
oh, he's got a bear tag this spring. They'll be like, what? Why would he do that? You know, it's like, you have to talk them through it. And I understand they don't get it, but it's stupid to me. I know all those people eat like really shitty meat from horrible places. So I don't know. There's definitely a feel of, oh, this animal is special because of this reason. I remember listening to a podcast um, it's called like the lifestylist if anyone's ever heard of it and the guy pretty much brings on experts in different fields um, that like they explore everything from like massages to what kind of food to eat and so this one was about like is being vegan uh, actually good and the the guy made, made a really interesting point that we choose like you would never kill a, or eat a dog or kill a dog because you look at it and you see like oh it's got a human's eyes right the human expression and but you'd eat a you'd kill a cow before that and then you would kill a cow before you'd eat, kill this and so like the whole like hierarchy and he based it all on the idea of we look at an animal and we relate it to ourselves and yeah. so an insect or a bug it's not even close to us like well of course you just smash it boom there you go it's dead great and like, but an animal that has like emotion in its face or moves in a certain way, it's really oh. hard to do that. And so you see like videos of, oh, like you live in Fairfield, Connecticut and only experience a bear ever. It's like, <laughs> there it is rolling with its cubs, hugging them. And like, yeah. look at a mother and how can Sam go out and kill a mother, right? And so it's an interesting connection in that way um, yeah. that we really can't, to like a chicken, they're running around like, do they even have brains? Like, how have Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then a deer, like, it moves elegantly. Oh, well, I, I couldn't shoot a deer. Yeah. Uh, it's really we're also, yeah, we're culturally, you know, indoctrinated with that, though. I mean, look at Disney. Yeah. Um, sure you know, Disney. it's we're, we're culturally indoctrinated with it. I also think like the hatred of predators that comes is culturally indoctrinated. It's definitely based in like real world experience, but it's also like whether it's the three little piggies and the big, big bad wolf, little red riding hood and the big bad wolf. We're growing up listening to that and that sets our opinions of things really early. And I think especially in the hunting community, especially in the conservation community, um, language has played such a huge part of our biases that we haven't even begun to dug in, dig into. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning a lot. You guys are all dropping knowledge. Go ahead, Sam. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, personally, from my perspective as like a new hunter, my mindset is not if you like pass up on – a spike versus a bull but i plan on hunting animals that i plan on eating so like if like i don't see it being a moral issue of like passing up a cow if you want to look for a bull just because i plan on eating either one of those if i were to shoot it but uh personally like in my point of view like for a bear i've never tasted black bear I worked to get one. I would love to try it. Would love to eat it. Would love to give it to some of my friends. But that's my Absolutely. biggest thing of why I've gotten into hunting is I want to uh, provide for myself the meat that I can eat and give to friends and family. Um, so, in terms of trophy hunting, like I, I I don't look down on it at all. Um, but just kind of where I stand is. I only want to hunt something that I will plan on eating. If I were to shoot a wolf, I would like to try eating a wolf. Mm -hmm. I, I've never eaten technically. People look at that as a dog, but I would definitely, I would definitely put my heart into eating it. <laughs> but <laughs> I, Just I don't tell Bo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but I as I'm getting more and more into hunting, I plan on eating everything I shoot is kind of my perspective on it. The, the sharing component I think is really valuable that, I mean, MJ is in the other room. She just got home, but she, uh, she became a vegetarian when she was nine. I could be wrong with my ages, but nine 
and a vegan when she was, I believe, 13 or 14. And so she'd been really removed from that space for a long, long time. And I mean, living in Oregon, like Jaden had said, is like, it, you're better to be walking around with um, birds on your shoulders petting them than you <laughs> to, to even mention you have a gun. Like, it's just as the vibe on campus. And uh, so it's really cool having her be here in Wyoming, which I know she had a lot of hesitancy about moving here. Like, isn't everybody's eating steak all the time kind of vibe? And <laughs> that for her we have friends who hunt and they make like these delicious looking like uh elk meatballs or whatever it might be and it, it's something that actually is interested her and so it's really exciting that she has moved towards a when our friend next friend gets um an animal and that like having them prepare it for her is something she'd be actually willing to try meat for the first time and 16 17 years whatever that is so it, it can be approachable and, and i think that that the sharing of the meat is a tough thing because you put it in all the work right you walked all those miles you were patient for that meat you did the pulling of the trigger the all that cleaning all that kind of stuff and then to go and just give it to your buddies like it just it seems kind of goofy but i think i've never met power within that yeah i've never met a hunter that didn't share I've That's never awesome. met a hunter. I, w I was lucky enough this last fall to spend 17 days in the Northwest Territories of Canada hunting doll sheep. And I, like the woman that I was up there with um, who shot the sheep and I had a caribou tag, uh, when we brought that sheep home and we split it down the middle and neither one of us had one meal of that sheep's meat that wasn't shared with someone else that hadn't been on that hunt that hadn't been like part of our close family like it was just like i don't know anybody that's a hunter that doesn't like isn't very giving with that they, we call it venison diplomacy like there's like mm. there's a phrase for it <laughs> yeah i mean it, it just it's almost just to reiterate it for you it's uh it pays off with people like myself and others who like view it as a oh well like could I be out there killing an animal myself and all that whole space that it, I mean, the whole full table model, we're doing it virtually these days, uh, thanks to COVID, but um, the whole model is to have people sit around a table together and like, ideally we would just make this food and we would pass around in bowls and like, hey, do you mind handing me the wine? And like, it brings people together in a beautiful way. And I think especially when it's been um, killed or, even um, like, hey, go out and pick mushrooms by yourself. Like that people bringing it that they've really worked um, to get, it's, it's incredible. Uh, any other last thoughts, questions? I'll, I'll let you guys go here in a moment, but I really appreciate you all. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously the one asking all the questions. It's a great learning experience for me. I appreciate it. We have a freezer full of uh, friends meet from, you know, that they've given us. So we've definitely reaped the uh, rewards of, of the hunt. And Ryan is usually along on some of those, but uh, yeah, it's, it's great. It lasts forever. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I, I don't have any last questions, but this is, this is amazing. This is like very informative. This learned a lot of stuff I didn't know. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Ditto. It's been really fun. Thank you for letting me join in at the last minute. <laughs> Without a doubt. No, I mean, you were, you were the encyclopedia for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up in the next uh, little bit here with um, the recording and to share some stoke and we'll get everybody in touch. So if you make your way, Jess and Jaden over here to um, Jackson to get out with one of these people and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, Again, hike around in my hiking shoes and a backpack for anybody who will have me. So, uh, <laughs> you to land there every once in a while too, like probably more often than your average Jackson people. So, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Be careful what you guys are offering. I've got seven days of elk hunting planned in your neck of the woods. So, if you're offering <laughs> backpack. I might be calling. <laughs> Please do. That's about all I'm good for. Your here. picture might end up in the <laughs> bag. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you, I, uh, go ahead, Jane. Oh, I was just going to say, I've got some bear meat, and we're supposed to make a trip. We've got a, a, another office in Jackson, 
so I will be letting you all know when I swing by. I'll have some uh, breakfast sausage to share with, share with everybody. Uh, it should be pretty soon. Like, it's nice come on. Cool. Nice. Oh, fun. Appreciate that. Well, cheers to you all. Uh, have an awesome night, and uh, we'll be in touch here soon. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye.